Welcome to Draft Utopia on TalkShoe. My name is Chris Ransom. Joining me today, Andrew Kermish, and we've got a great show lined up for you guys. We're going to talk Florida State, Alabama. We'll introduce the brand new Draft Watch segment, which is going to be like CBS's Money Watch with Draft Prospects presented by FanSpeak, which will be a sneak preview of our new board and some of the players on the rise. We're going to have SWAT reports for the quarterbacks. Ryan's going to come on a little bit later and break down some NBA teams after Joey goes into work. And then I think I'm going to wrap it up by mentioning Gordon Wild and Tomas Hilliard Arce, two of the prospects in the Super Draft for 2018 that I watched on tape this weekend. So we've got a fantastic show for you lined up. Pretty chill show too, but the main topic in college football was Florida State and Alabama on ABC number three versus number one. And since Kerm's team's Alabama, my and uh, I figured I will talk about what Florida State did well and what they did horrible in, and then I'm going to let Kerm talk about Alabama. So with Florida State, they actually kept this game relatively close in the first half, and it looked like they had more success when it came to executing and getting basic first downs. And... I really did like Auden Tate's catch over Minka Fitzpatrick. I was more impressed by that than I was by Calvin Ridley's big playability because none of the big plays he made came against Tarvaris McFadden, who I really like at cornerback. But Calvin Ridley did, still did make big plays, and he got by McFadden to get that two-point conversion for Alabama later in the game. Derwin James was phenomenal, easily the best player on both teams. The problem was DeAndre Francois just made a lot of mistakes, and Alabama just showed more heart. They, they wanted this game more. They took control of the game in the second half, and really, Florida State's turnovers absolutely killed their chances of coming back in this game because they had multiple opportunities to get back in this game. And I'll credit Ronnie Harrison. He did a good job on some plays. But Alabama just really executed and won the turnover battle. Whereas Florida State, they had opportunities. It was a low-scoring game. They didn't really seize any of those opportunities. And Alabama just capitalized in the turnover department in the second half. I think that was the biggest reason Alabama won. And yes, they were the better team. I know you're happy about that. But what am I missing here, Kerm? Go ahead. Well, they, I think that they, that Francis they were good as the Florida State quarterback. I can't remember how to pronounce his name. It's DeAndre they Francois. Play, they, they, yeah, DeAndre Francois. They played a good game, but they win. They, Alabama got the turnovers. That's when it started to play. That's when it started to just snowball for him. When they when Alabama bought that bought that hunt, it, that's when it started to snowball. That, with that box hunt, which is I, I said at the time that it was that it was huge. That it was a huge and they definitely was. That's when the moment the turned was on that box hunt because up until that time the team broke perfectly even. It was a defensive struggle. That was really unfortunate. Yeah, because he could not put any weight on it. And that was really unfortunate with DeAndre Francois, the way he went down. I know they took him into like some tent or some sort of a, I think it's a medical facility. It looks like a tent or a team, yeah, but it's a medical facility. Yeah, it's a small medical tent, small medical tent to give them the privacy and to keep the media away. I don't know, actually, actually came up with that a couple of years before anybody 
somebody else. That's really neat. Uh, so they, hopefully it's not a bad injury, but I'm, a, I'm afraid it is, which is that's true. Florida State has no shot in the in the in the in, 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 in the ACC. Yeah, you're and right. If that's true. If this injury is as severe as you believe it is, then Florida State is out, and it's probably going to come down to the Clemson-Louisville winner in two weeks because whoever wins that game in week three will have a, pa a cakewalk path to the ACC championship with uh, Francois being injured because you look at DeAndre Francois, Florida State does host Miami-Florida in week three, but with DeAndre Francois injured, the U actually has a very good chance of beating Florida State for the first time in a few years. And that's going to alter a lot in the ACC. So, I, I think whoever wins the game in two weeks, the Clemson-Louisville game in two weeks, whoever can win that game has a great shot of going undefeated if, uh, if Francois misses any serious time, because that's a huge loss for Florida State. Wasn't it like, uh, wasn't it 10-7 at halftime, then the block punt happened, Alabama got a field goal to take a 13-7 lead, and then Damian Harris ran it in to make it 19-7, they went for two, and Calvin Ridley caught the two-point conversion. Isn't that how the score ended up being 21-7? Yeah, but what happened, they, Alabama punted a field goal attempt at the end of the half, and they went for two, and then they walked and only got a field goal out of it. Out of that, when they scored then on the East Street kickoff, they, they, they forced the fumble and got the, and, and Damian Harris scored off, scored off of that. But it was a forced fumble on the, the, on, on the kickoff at the 11th. Then the Turner took it out of the end zone and they forced the fumble out of them. Yeah, I mean, Florida State just didn't capitalize. They had numerous opportunities. They, there was a play where they were nearing the red zone in the late second quarter. DeAndre Francois threw an interception. Then you had the block field goal at the end of the first half. So Florida State had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And Alabama's defense just showed up to play. That's really all you can say about this game. I mean... It's unfortunate for Florida State, and yet yeah, Auden Tate and Derwin James made some big plays, but the bottom line is they lost DeAndre Francois, they lost the game, and a 14-point loss to Alabama does not reflect on their playoff standings well, and if they lose Francois for the year, they're done. Another quarterback that got injured who might be done for the year is Georgia's Jacob Eason. The true sophomore towards ACL, MCL, and PCL, from what we've been hearing, even though their Mark Brick has not declared any status on Jacob Eason, from what I've been hearing, that he tore all of those ligaments, ACL, MCL, and PCL, on a knee injury, and that might cause him to miss the rest of the season as well. So Francois and Jacob Eason, who most believe are the top two quarterbacks in the 2019 draft, are both probably done for the year. So if Jalen Hurts has a big year, he has a chance to improve his stock for next season. But I think he's a guy who should just stay in Alabama, get his degree, and really work on perfecting his game because he has a lot of things he needs to work on right now at this point in his career. Because even though he's got 4-4 speed and he's a great dual threat, he has a lot as far as passing and as far as technique goes that he needs to work on. So... That was the, our thoughts on the Florida State-Alabama game, and 
Joseph Potter is about to call in, and we wrapped up a great conversation about Florida State versus Alabama. We were going to get into our next segment here, um, our top five, uh, our uh, draft watch board presented by Fanspeak. I was going to get into my top five players who helped their stock, other players who hurt their stock, and then we'll go over some of the SWAT reports and see what quarterbacks corrected strengths and weaknesses. So right now, my stock up one player is going to be Central Michigan corner Amari Coleman. He had two interceptions, including a one-handed catch like Odell Beckham. And last year, Central Michigan's corner held James Washington, Corey Davis, and Kenny Galladay under 100 yards. When you consider that Jair Alexander got injured, McFadden and Minka Fitzpatrick, they had their moments in Florida State versus Bama, but they were both inconsistent as well. Coleman's the one cornerback that got noticed. So Amari Coleman's a player to keep an eye on for Central Michigan. I would, I would, I would say Minka was, uh, was the, the one cornerback that got noticed. Uh, he just got burnt. He just got burnt, so they won a time. I really like Auden Tate, though. I that think... Was, that was on the phase route. So he really wasn't in I talked to other people that disagreed and thought he didn't play with enough intensity in this game. So Menka's first game was a mixed review. He gave up the touchdown to Auden Tate on the uh, play in the red zone. And there were some other plays where a few receivers got by him, but he really didn't give up any big plays like any 30, 40, 50 yard deep threats. He didn't give up a play like that, which is good. And that's why I don't think he falls out of the first round yet because of his variety and versatility. At the same time, he did give up a touchdown. He did give up a few plays. He's more of a mid to late first round guy like Marlon Humphrey than a guy who is top five or top 10 material. So. It's one game. If he can fix those issues and dominate moving forward, he can he can easily work his way into that role. But right now, I think Amari Coleman really was the one corner who made a statement. Um, Jake Wanecki out of South Dakota State had four receiving touchdowns on six receptions versus Duquesne. He only had 75 yards, but this is a guy that we talked about last week in the mock draft show. Jake Wanecki, Joey Mockman, the Patriots. So... He's a guy I really like on tape, though. Very consistent. Just seems like an all-around complete blue-chip receiver, even though he plays for an FCS school in South Dakota State. So we'll see what Wynicki does this year. We'll see what he does in Mobile. We'll see what he does at the Combine. It's going to be a step-by-step -step thing with Wynicki, just like it was with Cooper Cup. He can have all these dominant games in the FCS, but if he doesn't dominate against NFL competition, none of it matters on his draft resume. So... We'll see what Wynicki does, but he's a player who's on my radar. Um, next player um, is Drew Locke out of Missouri. He didn't make our quarterback SWAT report rankings, but this is a guy I've heard great things about. Um, 521 passing yards against Missouri State. My thing is, he struggled against LSU in Florida last year, and his performances against SEC teams were pretty inconsistent, so... He needs to play well versus quality competition, but with his size at 6'4", 225, with his ability to take snaps under center, he's on the radar. He's a blip on the radar, and if he does well versus the SEC this year, he could surge up boards like Blaine Gabbard or Mike Glennon did. Doesn't mean he'll make a substantial well, impact in the Chris, NFL, but he'll surge. He might surge. Chris, let me put it this way. If Florida plays the rest of the season like they played yesterday, he won't have a problem against Florida. Yeah, Duke Dawson is a good corner, but everybody else on that defense was absolutely horrendous. I mean, outside yeah, of the Duke uh, Dawson pick six, that entire defense looked terrible. C.C. Jefferson did have a sack. He did get by Mason Cole. But other than those two players... Nick Washington disappointed. He was supposed to be the next Marcus May. He disappointed, and everybody else on that defense just sucked. So there's no sugarcoating it. But maybe 
I think LSU is probably going to be the bigger challenge for Drew Locke, though, since they have Kevin Tolliver, they do have Ed Paris. LSU is a team that kept Locke from getting any rushing or passing touchdowns last year. Um, but Drew Locke's a player on the radar. He's a true junior, 20 years old, has a lot of things you want. Um, Minnesota defensive tackle Steven Richardson held Buffalo's entire rushing game to 51 rushing yards, and they're starting running back to 22 rushing yards. 6'3", 300, could be a riser if he plays at a high level. And my final riser who stocks up is Ty Johnson out of Maryland. This is a guy who had 100 rushing yards, over 100 rushing yards on the Texas Longhorns. Tony sent me his highlight reel in the summer. I was impressed, but I wanted to see more consistency. He still hasn't shown me the pass blocking I want to see, but it's not a concern. It's more of a mystery. It's more of a question mark. But his ball carrier vision superb. Ty Johnson went into Austin. He got 100 rushing yards, and he torched Malik Jefferson. Malik Jefferson out of Texas displayed very limited instincts in this game. And I know he's Ryan's favorite linebacker, so Ty Johnson got noticed. Mark kept messaging me about Ty Johnson and his spectacular play at running back for Maryland yesterday. Maryland dropped 51 points on the Texas Longhorns in Austin, so Ty Johnson definitely deserves recognition and props for that. Great job by Maryland. Johnson stepped up even when the quarterback got injured and left the game. He continued to have big plays. So that's that's good leadership on his end. All right, now we'll talk about some guys who, um, before we get to the quarterback SWAT reports, we'll talk about some guys who hurt their stock. Let's start in Pittsburgh with Jordan Whitehead. This is a guy who got suspended the first three games for a DUI back in July. And... Youngstown State pushed Pittsburgh to overtime because Jordan Whitehead decided to get a DUI. And it feels like this happens every few years. Once Pitt's about to get a first-round prospect, they have to go get a DUI and really kill their stock. It happened with Baldwin. I think Baldwin still ended up going in the first round, but he ended up being a huge disappointment. Tyler Boyd also fell to the second round, and now you've got Jordan Whitehead with another DUI. So this is the third Pitt prospect who entered the year as a first-round prospect who got busted for a DUI, the third player since 2011. And that's a little bit concerning. I'm not sure how that affects well, Pittsburgh's reputation, but it's unfortunate to say the least. Here is how it affects Pittsburgh's reputation. The coaches aren't that smart. Beginning of the year, what do you do? You tell all your players, kids, this is the age of technology. Without your smartphones, have them without their smartphones. Have them download Lyft and Uber. Kids, if you're going to go out drinking, just tap the app. Very easy. Put in where you are, where you're going, and wait. They'll get you there. No problem. The UI avoided. That's all you need. Yeah, but the, appeal to their sense of technology. You'll have them. Yeah, but I mean, I know coaches things. are around 60 years old these days. I mean, they don't understand this stuff. But, we have to you know, innovate. We have to make sure these kids are making better decisions. Joey's right. Yeah, yeah, you, you gotta think yeah, like a 15-year-old high school girl. I'm sorry. Yeah, but, yeah, but Joey, what's wrong with Joey, though? You basically set a standard and say you download Uber on your smartphone or you lose your scholarship. That's the mentality you have to have. Because here's the thing about scholarships, Chris. Everybody says, 
Hey, he got a four-year ride. No person in the history of school has ever gotten a four-year ride. Scholarships are year-to-year -year scholarships. They have to be renewed every year. The school can rescind a scholarship any year simply by not renewing it. So every scholarship, they can say, you get a four-year free ride. But no, no, no. That's misinterpretation. That is what the school will tell you, but that's not actually the truth. They can choose not to renew any scholarship. They have to... They have to choose not to renew some scholarships because they, at least in college, at least in Division One FBS, you're allowed 25 scholarships, but, but you're only allowed a total of 85 players on. That, 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 that's on. That's on. A, that's on a scholarship. Yeah. Yes, and also for academic reasons and so on and so forth. So. And if you have, like, say you have another timer they want to, so, to play some football and baseball, or, you know, you got a guy that's low level, got maybe a baseball scholarship, but also plays football, he's a, a scout team player and stuff, his baseball scholarship counts as, counts as a, also counts as a, a, as a, a football one. Yeah, because the scholarships aren't actually for sports, they're for the academics. So they can say, well, we brought it in and gave you a scholarship for football, but that doesn't matter because that scholarship doesn't pay for your football, it pays for your education. So it, I mean, basically it's only one scholarship per person. But if they play two sports, well... It would count for two sports then, wouldn't it? Yeah. So, so it's definitely, it is year by year, and so if you don't do good as a junior, it's quite possible that if you don't play up to the senior senior scholarship will not be a, will not be honored. Yep. So, anyway, well, this is all interesting, well and good. Let's get back to some uh, of the other prospects. Have to go early, so let's get this thing on the road. All right. Next prospect who hurt his stock is Connor Williams out of Texas. I know one of my friends said he's better than Mike McGlinchey on tape, but his ability to maintain blocks is terrible, and his foot speed might be better, but he has small arms. Garrett Bowles had big arms. That's why he benefited from having good foot speed, because he, his ability to maintain blocks needed work, but he had long arms. That's why he was able to make it work. Now, with Williams, he has short arms. He's 6'6", 320, and he, if he kicks inside to guard, he's not going to have the pad level to go up against defenders. You move him to right tackle, he might not have the strength to maintain blocks. And he's not an NFL left tackle based on the tape I've seen against Maryland, but he's versatile enough to play both right tackle or guard because they at Coppell High School they put him at four of the five positions on the O-line. I'm just not sure where Connor Williams is going to end up converting to in the NFL, but he's not the tackle that's going to challenge McGlinchey to be the number one offensive tackle. McGlinchey just dominated versus Temple, and Connor Williams laid an egg versus Maryland. Next we have Harold Landry. Harold Landry went up against the Northern Illinois team that lost left tackle Levy and Myers to graduation. With Arden Key injured, this was Landry's window of opportunity to have a statement game where he could have two, three, maybe even four sacks. Landry played so sloppy in this game that he actually put the left tackle that replaced Myers on the map, on the draft radar. He got pushed back by Northern Illinois' left tackle four times. No quarterback hurries, no sacks, no tackles for a loss. No top five pick. He was not even double teamed in the contest. And Landry just had a very sluggish game. Now, I don't think this affects his first round status, Joey. But at the same time, he's not going to go top five now. Because this is a game where if he showed he could correct his swim move, build on the sacks and momentum he had last year, he'd go top five. Now Harold Landry is no longer a top five prospect. He's, he can still be a top 10 or maybe even a top 15 prospect, but he's no longer a top 5 prospect th thanks to this game. 
unless he really turns the corner and dominates in the draft process. Because it's the first game of the year. If he has a couple dominating games against tougher competition, that puts him right back in there. Yeah, he did well versus Mitch Hyatt last year. He did well versus Roderick Johnson and Brock Rootable last year on Florida State. He did well versus some teams who had good left tackle situations. So if he rebounds, he does well versus Clemson's Mitch Hyatt. He does well versus teams with really good left tackles. He's back in the conversation. But he's got to have a big game versus Clemson where he has two or three sacks versus Hyatt now because the pressure's on him after this game. Remember, for everybody listening, you have to remember, the first game only really matters in a set of this could be a make or break for potential franchise quarterback. Potential franchise quarterbacks are held to a different standard than everybody else. So, one game is not going to make or break your draft stop unless you are a quarterback and you just completely bomb against Competition. All right. We got two more players to get to. Um, Archie Lewis out of Boise State. This is a guy who entered the year as the starting left tackle. He got beat out for the left tackle job by a freshman redshirt. When you're a senior, you have great left tackle tape as a junior, and you get beat out by a freshman. That's not going to reflect well on you. You're supposed to be the leader of the offensive line. You're supposed to set the standard and you lost the job at left tackle to a freshman, that's not good. A freshman better be the number one overall pick at some point. I mean, Archie Lewis has first-round talent on tape from what we saw last year, but the problem is he didn't play against Troy. He wasn't injured, he was healthy, but he just didn't maintain the left tackle job. So clearly the coaches don't think as highly of him, or maybe... I'm, I don't know. I just don't want to believe I was wrong about Archie Lewis because he had excellent tape in the games I watched. But he's 24 years old. He, he's older than most offensive tackles. So this, this definitely hurts his stock now that he's lost the left tackle job. He might fall to day three. Too early to say. It's only one game. Uh, I know Boise State plays New Mexico at 8 p.m., so I might get a little bit of action in that game before the Patriots game. It's too early to say. Uh, final player that probably oh, hurt his you stock. You get a little bit of action before that game, huh? And by action, lucky guy. by action, yeah. I mean repetition at offensive tackles. You are thinking of a different form of action, but let's move on to the final player. Uh, you, you said you might get a little bit of action. I just want to know who the lucky guy was. <laughs> okay, and finally, we have Mason Cole, who just played awful on Michigan's offensive line versus Florida. They moved him back to left tackle, and that was a horrible decision by Jim Harbaugh and his staff because this guy is barely over 300 pounds, and you're putting him at left tackle against SEC competition. That was a horrible decision by Harbaugh. I was debating whether to move him or Bo Scarborough down, but... Bo actually had a solid game. Mason Cole, on the other hand, was the top center in the draft, and he completely bombed at left tackle versus Florida, opening up a window of opportunity for Will Clapp and Bradley Bozeman, the Alabama center. So we'll see what happens, though. Um, that's it for the NFL Draft Watch presented by Fanspeak. We're going to get into the quarterback SWAT report rankings now, and... What I'm going to do is I'm going to point out some of the flaw, strengths, weaknesses I saw with these quarterbacks, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Joey if he thinks they've corrected their weaknesses or not, because I feel like this is a team, this is a situation where there's a lot on the line. With Sam Darnold, he has the work ethic, he has the moxie, he plays with authority. The, one of the weaknesses, though, is... He has inconsistent accuracy. There are times where he's money with his throws, and then there are times where he'll underthrow a screen pass or overthrow a deep ball. And that's why I believe saying Sam Darnold is pinpoint accuracy is foolish. I mean, he had zero passing touchdowns, two interceptions. He had a rushing touchdown, but one thing we pointed out last with his tape is he has atrocious mechanics and inconsistent delivery. This game was on the Pac-12 network, so it's hard to say if 
he's corrected his issues. I do believe that his mechanics look better, but at the same time, he just looked awful. Now, with Western Michigan, they do have two NFL draft prospects on their secondary that Ryan found. So, Darnold didn't get any time from his offensive line. The offensive line collapsed without Chad Wheeler, Zach Banner, Damian Mama. The wide receivers kept dropping passes, and a lot of people in the draft community want to give Darnold a pass for that game because his receivers dropped passes even though he was making the right throws. So, what are your thoughts on this? I, 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 I'm not sure if Darnold has corrected his weaknesses. I mean, it feels like he has, but at the same time, the, the, the game tape says otherwise. And next week he plays a Stanford team with two NFL corners, so he has to rebound in that game, or his, he's going to fall out of the number one spot. I haven't watched the tape, but from the stats that you are sending me in the update, he looked like he'd be a mid to late first round pick, just based off the stats you sent. Well, he so you finished know the the... there, but the uh, stats indicate that he, with the mechanics that have created the inconsistency and the poor throws and the potential for turnovers. So, I need to watch the tape, but from what you sent me, it doesn't look good. Yeah, and he did finish the game on a high note. He went 23 for 33, 289 passing yards, zero passing touchdowns, two interceptions, two sacks. He had one rushing touchdown, which tied the game at 21, completed 69.7% of his passes in the game, had more yards per attempt, but at the same time, his longest throw of the game was 42 yards. Last year, his longest throw was 67 yards. This was a really passive game on Darnold's end, and we'll see, because this is... Darnold really interviewed well on uh, Adam Schefter's podcast, but I, I don't know if he spent enough time fixing the mechanics or what not, because Western Michigan was actually ahead at one point in this game. Western Michigan was ahead until the fourth quarter of this game. So the fact that Western Michigan led at halftime and led for most of the third quarter, that doesn't hurt Darnold's case. I mean, USC is a team that's supposed to beat Western Michigan by uh, 20 points in the first half. They're supposed to be that team, and they weren't that team yesterday. That's the kind of performance you want to see from Darnold if you want to cement him as the number one pick, and he didn't show that. So that's a little bit concerning. I'm not going to take him out of the top five yet, but I don't think he's going to go number one overall now. And if he struggles versus Stanford, he's probably going to fall to the mid to late first round like you suggested, Joey. Any thoughts on that before we move on to the next quarterback? Let's move on. All right. Next up, we have Lamar Jackson. Now, Lamar Jackson had a lot of very good qualities on tape. The field vision can make one-step, three-step, five-step throws, can make up to four progressions, can attack the hole right away on a running play if he doesn't see. Uh, his excellent production allowed him to win the Heisman. The one things he needed to work on was improve his completion percentage, complete passes more consistently. He held on to the ball for too long at times last year. Um, Lamar Jackson versus Purdue. He traveled to Purdue and... Right now, it's interesting because Lamar Jackson, he went 30 for 46. He went 378 passing yards, two passing touchdowns, no interceptions. His completion percentage in 2016 was 56.2. He improved that to 65.2. So he improved his completion percentage by nine points in uh, the game. He still had 100 rushing yards. Even though he didn't get a rushing touchdown, he still had 100 rushing yards. He made big plays when he needed to, and he focused a lot more on being a pocket quarterback, even though his offensive line gave him barely any time. And 378 passing yards, no turnovers, a win despite struggling early in the game. That's an impressive performance by Lamar Jackson when you consider he had 485 total yards even though he focused more on being a pocket quarterback, and he did something Watson didn't do. He avoided turnovers, which is another thing he needs to get credit for. Well, that is 
very good. It's all well and good. But remember, Chris, I love the fact that he had the production. I love the fact that he was focusing more on his pocket presence in the offseason. But you have to remember, that completion percentage is one game. I've seen people with 80% completion percentage one game and 51% completion percentage the next. One game. It is. And Mahomes had like 70%, but that declined over the year. So it's one game. It's a week-to-week basis. So it's great that he improved his completion percentage, but at the same time, he plays uh, Clemson in two weeks, and Clemson was the team that handed Louisville their first defeat last year. So week three, Lamar Jackson plays Clemson. If he can maintain that completion percentage, is he the number one quarterback? If he can maintain that completion percentage through the next game and through the Clemson game, is can he be the first quarterback drafted? If he maintains that completion percentage and leads Louisville to a 3-0 start and maintains great numbers. Remember, consistency is what it takes to consistency. That's what I'm saying. But if he does that, will he be in a position where he'll control his own destiny? If Yes. So that's, that's sort of why I'm believing he is the first quarterback drafted. But remember, it's too early. This is going to be a competition. Like... There's going to be so much movement with the quarterbacks this year throughout the season. It's literally going to be like dancing with the stars. But let's move on to our next star, Baker Mayfield. Began the game 19 for 19, had 320 passing yards against UTEP in the first half, and really played with a lot of authority. He played with a lot of moxie. He he didn't take as many sacks. I mean, Orlando Brown was phenomenal in this game, and Orlando Brown may be the third offensive tackle drafted. Might even be the guy who challenges McGlinchey, like you said on the Evolution Network in our Orlando Brown special, but let's focus on Baker Mayfield because we're here to talk about the quarterbacks today, and he went 19 for 20, had 329 passing yards, and his completion percentage currently sits at 95%. He did take one sack, but I mean, his longest throw in the game was a 51-yard pass. Let's see Baker do this in Columbus next week against Ohio State. Now, if Baker Mayfield has a game like this in Columbus, he's the number one pick. End of discussion. Because going 19 for 20 in Columbus is not only difficult to do, it's monumentally impressive to the point where I think Baker Mayfield would be considered the number one pick because in this game, Baker Mayfield averaged 16 yards per pass attempt. This is only one game, but that is really impressive. And if he can maintain that, he's got a great shot of being the top pick. The key word is consistency, yeah, like you said. is the guy that I pegged as the best quarterback in this class a year and a half ago, two years ago. I'm sticking with that. Uh, he just keeps getting better, consistent, just constantly keeps getting better. And that is what you're really looking at. That's what you're looking for. So, I mean, with Mayfield, he's like Lamar Jackson at this point. He controls his own destiny. If Mayfield wins the Heisman, then he's probably going to be a top five pick. And if, even if he doesn't win the Heisman, if he finishes with three years over 70% passing, it's his, it's his to lose at that point. Because people were saying, well, he doesn't have his offensive tackle, he doesn't have his two wide receiver. Let's see what he does. Well, he outperforms now. There is no saying that it was other people around him. It is all him. Exactly. I mean, Oklahoma's going to face tougher defenses later this year. I'm not even sure if Texas is considered a tough defense. I thought they would because they did have some NFL talent, but they gave up 51 points to Maryland, and 
Baker's probably going to light that defense like a Christmas tree if he just keeps playing the way he is. But this Ohio State game for Baker in Columbus is huge because if he rebounds, he avoids turnovers, he's automatically in the top 10, if not the top 5. All right, let's move on to our next quarterback, Mason Rudolph. I mean, my, my thing with Mayfield is that his ball placement was inconsistent. He's corrected that. So if Baker Mayfield has cor improved his arm strength, he's improved uh, my issues with uh, Mayfield were the arm strength and the ball placement. He's corrected both of those areas. And the only thing scouts are going to say is his size at 6'1", 210 is going to keep him from being elite. And I know Thomas Coburn, who loved Mayfield too, is sick of people comparing him to Drew Brees. But right now, that's the best comparison for Baker Mayfield is Drew Brees. I mean, you, I think that's the comp you gave him. So we'll move on to Mason Rudolph, though. Mason Rudolph went 20 for 24, 308 passing yards. I talked about with Mason Rudolph with Ryan on Friday's podcast, and all of the weaknesses that he had on tape displayed inconsistent accuracy. Short, medium, deep ball accuracy is terrible on tape, can only go 1-2. He went 1-2-3-4 on tape versus uh, Tulsa. Not a dual threat who wows you with speed. He improved his completion percentage. Sometimes he threw into coverage. He didn't throw into coverage against Tulsa. He remained calm. He... Want, he needed to improve composure-wise, but Ru Mason Rudolph, like Josh Rosen, one of his issues is that he tapped the football too much. He didn't tap the football at all versus Tulsa, and that's a very good sign. It's like Mason Rudolph did this versus Tulsa. Let's see Rosen do this versus A&M. He set the bar. He set the standard. The one thing you want to see Mason Rudolph work on, though, is his footwork. That is the one thing... I need to see more one-step, three-step, and seven-step drops. His five-step drops are better. He also does have small hands, just like with uh, Baker and Lamar, but I'm willing to look past that at this point. I don't care if you, about your hand size until we get to the combine, until all the facts are straightened out. So I'm not going to look at that right now. I'm going to look at what they're doing on the football field to help their teams win because that's what matters at this point in, in the season, even though it's only one week. So Mason Rudolph really impressed me. I've had him as a first to second round pick for a while, and Baker and Mason have both re-earned their first round status with their strong starts. And like Jackson, Mason's another player that controls his own destiny, Joey. Yeah, Rudolph came in with some questions. He and... I think if he continues to answer him, he could be a early first round pick. Basically, Mason Rudolph's the dark horse. As, yeah, I don't see him going as top five, but I could easily see him going top 10 to top 15 if he continues to impress. I'm, I'm on the same thinking there. I don't see him going top five, but I could see him going top 10 to top 15. Um,. Jake Browning was my fifth best quarterback. Um, he went 14 for 26 against Rutgers despite a win. He got laid out on one hit where he just got decked, and he got back up, and teammates rallied around that. So, But he did have an inconsistent game. He didn't fix his issues with deep ball accuracy. He had the work ethic and football IQ you want, and that's great and all. The field vision... Throwing into coverage, those are things we saw. He, we saw him underthrow receivers still. That's still an issue. His completion percentage, not sure what it is compared to last year, but this is not a game because this was a road game against Rutgers on Friday night that Jake Browning was in, and this was not a game where he came out and made a statement like we thought he would because I thought Jake Browning was going to be a guy who just came out and made a statement, and... That's not what we saw at all. In fact, his completion percentage is actually lower than it was last year at 56.7%. He went 17 for 30 versus Rutgers. He did get the win, but he got off to a very slow start in this game, and he looked sort of sloppy. So he didn't throw any turnovers. He didn't give up any fumbles. So he avoided turnovers. 
He threw for more yards per attempt. He played smart football, but he also played reckless football. So it's not a game where you can say uh, he hurt his stock, but it's not a game where you can say he helped his stock either. He still needs to do more to show us he's the man. But if he does, his stock will go up. So right now, I'm going to leave him where he is in the early round two range, but I'm not going to move him down or up. I'm just going to wait and see what he does, because that's really all I can do at this point with him. Last year when Washington hosted Stanford, Stanford's two best corners were both injured, and that's what allowed Browning to thrive in that game. He's going to be going to Stanford this year, later in the year, and those corners, if they're healthy, might be a different story. And Darnold's going to have to face those corners next week. So Jake Browning's a guy that he didn't hurt his stock, but he didn't help it either. What, any yeah, thought? you gave me a mix uh, signals about him all yesterday, and I haven't seen the tape, so I'll reserve judgment there. Luke Falk. Um, Luke Falk began the game 20 for 20 against a Washington State quarterback Luke Falk. This is a guy that Chris Robbins, who posts the tape in Lombardi as the number one quarterback, he led why he led Washington State to a 31 nothing victory over. Montana State, and he began the game 20 for 20 versus Montana State. Finished the game 33 for 39, 311 passing yards, three t passing touchdowns, no interceptions, two sacks, and really carried Washington State in this game. He improved his yards per attempt, he improved his completion percentage. And this is great and all, but every quarterback in this draft has at least an average of 8 yards per pass attempt. Luke Falk's yards per pass attempt is still at under 8 yards entering his senior year, which operate from a West Coast offense under center. You want to see him utilize the deep ball more. Luke Falk can have all the video game numbers he wants this year. The point is, scouts aren't really going to care unless Luke Falk shows he's that man in Mobile. He shows he can play under center. He shows he can make more deep throws. That's what scouts want to see with Luke Falk. And I feel like Luke Falk's a guy who can have all the very good statistics in the world, but he's not a guy that scouts are going to put on their radar unless he has a big week in Mobile like Carson Wentz did two years ago. Because he does some good things. He can read up to six progressions. There were at least a dozen plays against Washington last year where Luke Falk read five progressions. But none of the quarterbacks in the draft were that consistent at reading progressions. But he struggled versus quality opponents. He doesn't play in a West Coast offense. And he's still one-dimensional because he's a pure pocket QB. And while that's great and all, he wanna be, you want to see him have good games against good competition. That's something he struggled with. He didn't have good games against good competition Footwork's an issue. His ball placement is be getting better. He needs to place the ball higher, but he's getting better in that regard. So, I mean, Luke Falk could jump Jake Browning and move into the first round, but I'm going to leave him where I have him behind Jake Browning at the moment because I want to see what Luke Falk does versus a better opponent. Montana State's not an opponent where you can say, oh, Luke Falk went 20 for 20 against Montana State. So let's make put him into the first round. No, he's an FCS FCS team. Montana State's an FCS team, so you got to keep waiting it out with him. Next up, we have Josh Allen, the guy who got overhyped big time, the guy who was number one over Sam Darnold on Matt Miller's initial 2018 rankings. And I believe this is the most overrated quarterback in the draft, but at the same time, he's a guy who has borderline starter potential, but he has a lot of things where he has the physical tools are there, the massive hand size, which is going to get scouts to love him. There's a variety of offenses. There's a lot of things he likes, but the accuracy with Josh Allen is still an issue with me. And Josh Allen's game versus Iowa was not good. So stymied in a first tough test, so... I know the, the the ringer is saying it's too early to judge Josh Allen or Sam Darnold, and while that's true, 
Josh Allen was just horrendous. 23 for 40, 174 passing yards, zero passing touchdowns, two interceptions, three sacks. His offensive line did not give him any time in the pocket. His uh, receivers dropped everything that came his way. And Dane Brugler of CBS basically implied that Josh Allen deserves a pass for this game because he he's the leader of this team, but there's nobody else around him, and that's why his numbers were terrible. So it's not him, it's his team. And that just that just seems lazy to me. Allen's the quarterback. He's the team captain. He's the leader. He's got to make something happen. A 24-3 loss to Iowa in Kinnick Stadium is not a good way to start the year. And in two weeks... Wyoming has a home game against the Oregon Ducks. So if Josh Allen struggles there, every other draft analyst in the country who has a first-round grade on Allen is going to move him down to the second round, where I have him. And at that point, I might move him down to the third round. So it's looking like Josh Allen's going to become a day-two pick because all the things that I had listed as flaws in my SWAT reports, like the accuracy and his decision-making is terrible, how he doesn't recognize coverages... He didn't correct any of that, so that's a bit of a concern. Yeah, but, yeah, we'll see. The, the entire thing with Allen is that he has a lot of things going for him. But same thing with Darnold, we have to see because that's the because uh, he has to get his mechanics in order. That's the big downfall for these guys. Next quarterback is Josh Rosen. He did not play yesterday. He plays tonight at 7.30 on Fox versus the Texas Longhorns. And Gus Johnson is calling that game, so we're going to either get two reactions. We're either going to get the Gus Johnson who goes, Oh my, what a throw by Josh Rosen! Or we're going to hear Gus Johnson talking about how Josh, all, Josh Rosen taps the football, taps the football, taps the football, gets sacked by Dalen Mack for a loss of five yards. So, Gus Johnson's going to have a lot of influence on this game. How he calls the play, how he commentates the plays that Rosen makes or breaks is going to have an effect on his draft stock, because I could see Josh Rosen doing great in this game. I could also see him doing horrible again, and that's what's going to determine if he's a first or second round prospect, because I... I believe he's a second-round prospect. Ryan believes he's a second-round prospect. You believe he's a first-round prospect who's going to fall to the second round due to his character issues. And Tony and Mark both have a first-round grade on him. Mark still has a top-five grade on him despite the uh, things he said about football and academics not going together. And Tony dropped him to Buffalo at 12, but I don't even think the Bills would take him. So Josh Rosen, sort of a, a, a wild card himself. And... We need to see him not tap the football. If Gus Johnson's talking about how much he taps the football before a big play by Texas A&M's defense occurs, that just validates that he hasn't fixed his mechanics. Honestly, I don't think he cares about the game enough. Um, I think he's too full of himself. Who, Josh Rosen or uh, Gus Johnson? Uh, Rosen. <laughs> And we'll see what happens there, but I'm pretty sure he's not a franchise caliber quarterback at this point. Well, he is pursue. He wants to pursue his NBA, and the thing is, you can't get an NBA and be an NFL quarterback. You either become an NFL quarterback and get your NBA after your career retire career ends, and you make millions of dollars. And you go the Magic Johnson route, which I don't think Rosen has the patience to do, or you don't play in the NFL because 
I know one person told me they believe that the moment he gets a concussion, he's going to retire like Jake Locker and then just focus on his business and his career. So Josh Rosen has a lot of red flags, and I'm not sure if he cares either. He might suffer from the Jimmy Clausen syndrome. Yeah, but that said, I've got to go. I've got a lot of things going on today, so I will talk to you later, man. All right, later. And that was the final big-name quarterback. So we got Brian Shore out of James Madison. I'm going to look up what Brian Shore did for James Madison here. Um, what's, what's Kerm messaging me? Just, did Kerm leave as well? Yeah. So Kerm is the only one on the call right now at the moment. That's okay. We'll go over some of these SWAT reports here and... I'm going to go over some of these SWAT reports here since uh, Kerm and Joey both left the call. I want to thank them for chatting. And I know Ryan Romero is going to be here in a few minutes, so I'm going to look through. Uh, wow, perfect timing, Ryan. Very perfect timing because uh, Joey and Kerm just left to do other things, and you're here with me. So we went over the quarterback rankings, my SWAT reports, and... We talked about what quarterbacks fix their issues. Darnold, it's too early to say with him. The jury's still out. Lamar fixed his issues. Baker fixed his issues. Mason Rudolph fixed his issues. Jake Browning didn't do anything to fix, but he didn't do anything to hurt himself either. Luke Falk, he did well. Began the game 20 for 20, but he has to show he can play under center. And still only averaging 7 yards per pass attempt, which is a little bit concerning. So we'll see what happens with um Oh yeah, absolutely. We definitely have a deep fall. class of quarterbacks this year and I'm really looking forward to watching them play this season. Yep, and James Madison offense had trouble against East Carolina, so we'll see what happens with um East Carolina just Brian Shore only went 9 for 14, had 125 passing yards for um, James Madison, and that really hurts his stock because this was a guy I was really high on. He led his team to the FCS championship, and going 9 for 14 with 125 yards is a little bit disappointing. I mean, the Youngstown State's quarterback who got Senior Bowl preseason honors had 300 yards on Pittsburgh at Heinz Field, which is far more impressive, so... Maybe we picked the wrong FCS quarterback to put this high in our rankings. I do think we're going to see an FCS quarterback get noticed and move up the boards, but it's probably not going to be um, Brian Shore, even though I love what he did on tape heading into this year. This game versus East Carolina and FCS squad, this is a bad this is a bad this is bad for his resume because it's just not a it's not a strong game for his resume. Riley Ferguson out of Memphis is a third round guy. And tonight we get Josh Rosen in Texas A and M on Fox at 730. So I don't know if you're gonna go to a bar and watch that game or what the deal is, but that that's good that's gonna be a fun game to watch. And Riley Ferguson only had ninety seven passing yards versus Louisiana Monroe. Ooh, that's not good. I, I liked him better than Paxton Lynch on tape heading into this season, but 97 passing yards, 10 for 25, that is just awful. It's like that. Yeah, that is terrible. You can't win games like that, or at least play an NFL career. Like he, his team won 37 to 29, and it's great that Memphis won. But Brian Shore and Riley Ferguson were guys I had second, third round grades on, and they did terrible. So. They're guys who I'm probably going to have to move down in my mock draft this week. Um, Mike White out of Western Kentucky. This is a player that I'm looking up his tape right now, his um, numbers to see what he did well, what he didn't do well in, because Mike White is in a offensive system at Western Kentucky. He had 264 yards, one touchdown, no interceptions, Took three sacks, played carelessly. His completion percentage is worse than last year's. 
And this is against Eastern Kentucky, an FCS team. So too early to say, but he's probably a day three pick at the best. So after the top eight or nine quarterbacks in this class, probably the top eight because I have Allen at seven and Rosen at eight. Probably after the top eight quarterbacks, you're starting to see the drop off. I thought Shore could be QB nine, and we'd have nine QBs with second round grades, but with Shore not impressing, with Riley Ferguson not impressing, there's going to be a drop off after eight quarterbacks instead of nine, and that's really disappointing because I was looking forward to seeing what this class could do. You know, out of curiosity, Chris, I was wondering where did uh, Kenny Hill do yesterday? I think that was his name out of TPU. I did not have him in my fan speak. I, I, actually, I do have him in my fan speak board. I just don't have him on my... I didn't do a write-up on him because he was one of the guys that was undrafted, but he didn't make the cut. So I will get Kenny Hill's information up because I know you like Kenny Hill. I know Ken likes Kenny Hill. I know Thomas likes Kenny Hill. So he actually had an impressive opening day, but he plays Arkansas in a really tough test. He had... 18 for 23, 206 passing yards, four passing touchdowns, one interception, and he completed 78% of his passes. So he actually did very well despite the interception versus Jackson State. Next week he plays Arkansas, though, and he only had 206 yards. He didn't have 300 yards. He didn't wow you with arm strength, but he made good decisions. So Kenny Hill's one of these guys that he doesn't have the best arm, but he's accurate, he makes good decisions, and he can be a dual threat which is why a lot of people like him. I think he can be a solid backup in the NFL. I, you know, Chris, I agree with you on that. I was about to say, I'm like, he may not be like the most uh, strong quarterback as far as being able to air out the ball, but he definitely makes smart decisions. And to me, that's the game internet, and that's the kind of quarterback you'd want in case your guy goes down. Yeah, he could be a good backup. And Jared Stidham out of Auburn. They play Clemson next week, and Jarrett Stidham had an up and down. He had three touchdowns and a pair of turnovers in his first game, and Jarrett Stidham, I know some people had a first-round grade on him. I had a fourth-round grade on him simply due to his lack of experience, but he was going to be my riser. So he didn't show that this week. Um, Logan Woodside had a sloppy opening game. Quinton Flowers out of South Florida. I'll take a look at him now. Because he's the number, he's the final quarterback on my quarterback rankings. And then we can go through QBs that didn't make the rankings. Because those Q, there might be some QBs that didn't make my SWAT report rankings that deserve mentions or deserve spots when I update my quarterback rankings. Like, you know, because nobody's perfect and there's just as many people that miss on this stuff. That there is who hit. So I'm looking at what he did, and right now you're looking at um, with Quentin Flowers. He has a pretty bad completion percentage, but at the same time he has great dual threat ability. And when you watch his tape, he makes a lot of good plays. He makes a lot of plays. Only 186 yards versus Stony Brook is pretty pedestrian since they're an FCS school, but his ball placement is good. He's an excellent decision maker. He can extend plays. And you can make the argument that Quentin Flowers out of South Florida is a top five quarterback in this draft when it comes to extending plays by making things happen with his arm or legs. He's not a top five overall quarterback, but as far as extending plays goes, he's a top five quarterback in that category. He was voted team captain, back-to-back -back years at team captain. His accuracy and progressions, he's actually, his accuracy and progression still needs some work, but he doesn't display the accuracy you want under pressure. So you can argue there's a limited ceiling, but I think he has some things you want to work with here. So I'm going to load up my... Uh, fan speak board and see what undrafted quarterbacks had strong games because I feel like there's a lot of quarterbacks that really failed to impress in terms of getting their name on the map. Jeremiah Briscoe didn't really do much to impress me. I don't think there is an FCS QB that's going to go round one or round two now 
I was really pulling for um, Shore because we loved his tape, but he just didn't have a strong opening game. And Nick Stevens out of Colorado State was a guy who was initially in my rankings, but I took him out because Nick Stevens had durability issues. He could only make up to one progression, but he did beat Oregon State, Thomas's team, and Nick Stevens is playing better than the stats are indicating. But he struggled against Colorado in Colorado at Sports Authority Field. So he had three touchdowns. He had no touchdowns and two interceptions despite having 300 passing yards and despite improving his arm strength. The problem is his completion percentage is at a career low. He had no touchdowns against Colorado which is pretty terrible when you consider that Colorado lost three defensive backs to the NFL and you fail to throw a touchdown on them. He's done nothing to convince me he should be drafted. Now the next quarterback I had behind him is... I think the next QB I had behind him at 330 was Kenny Hill. Kenny Hill could be a solid backup and he could jump into the rankings... The next quarterback I had behind Kenny Hill was JT Barrett out of Ohio State. And Barrett had a strong game. When you consider, even though JT Barrett's completion percentage was terrible, when you consider how good he played, he played well enough to earn a senior bowl invite. If he keeps playing like he did versus Indiana the rest of the season, he'll get into the senior bowl and he'll have a chance to do something in Mobile. And I'll admit I did probably rank him a little bit too low, and I do see a career backup, but I see a career backup who can be effective in the right situation, a la Joshua Dobbs. And that's sort of what I see with JT Barrett this year. So, yeah, I mean... I was actually impressed with JT Barrett. I think he has some really good arm strength. I think the part of the reason his completion percentage isn't as high is because he's not afraid to take that risk and throw it downfield and really air out the ball. I actually can see him starting as long as he continues to develop just because of that arm strength. And the fact that he seemed like he had some decent pocket pressure. Yeah, he did not have a... He has not been able to stay healthy. There have been other concerns. He did horrible in the playoff last year versus Clemson. So... Indiana has an NFL-caliber secondary, and he avoided turnovers for them, so that's good for JT Barrett. He goes from being undrafted to possibly being a late-round pick with this statement game. After the top eight quarterbacks, it's wide open for that number nine spot now behind Josh Rosen, and I have a late second-round grade on Rosen with eight QBs going in the second round. So JT Barrett could go anywhere from as early as the third round to the undrafted range. It's too early to gauge what area he's going to end up in at this point. It's too early to gauge the exact precise area, but he's one of those guys who could go as anywhere as early as round three, but he could, I could also see him going undrafted. I need to see more from him, but I like what I saw last week. No, I agree with you, Chris. I really, kinda, I really liked what I saw last week from him. Um, I mean, like I said, he showed that arm strength. He showed poise. I can see him jumping up to the second round, but they would have to definitely do well in the playoffs. Yeah, and I just feel like he probably is a better quarterback to draft than Josh Rosen, but the problem is Josh Rosen just has more exposure from the media, whereas JT Barrett doesn't have that. And while he does have some exposure, there's coaches who just see a career backup in him. There's scouts who see a career backup in him, and that's going to get teams to shy away from him, even though he did have some moments in that game. His ability to read progression still needs work, but he can make the right throws. If he if he avoids turnovers and he just goes for it, sometimes he'll get lucky, he'll make the right throw, and that's what happened this week. So too early to say, but those are all the quarterbacks in our fan speak top 400. And with really only seven or eight quarterbacks, with Rosen and, with Darnold and Allen struggling, the media darlings who interviewed Adam Schefter with them having bad games, with all of the guys who were projected to go in rounds three through seven struggling, and with this quarterback group, there might be a run on quarterbacks because 
there's a drop-off after Josh Rosen at 8 on my quarterback rankings. There's a drop-off between the starting quarterbacks and the career backups because Riley Ferguson and Brian Shore, while I had them pegged as borderline starters, they're both backups now. I'm probably going to wait another week to update the QB rankings, though, because we I want to see what Darnold does versus Stanford because he struggled versus Western Michigan. And Western Michigan has some very good football players. Stanford's got two NFL corners. So I want to see what Sam Darnold does versus Stanford next week on Fox. Because I he was on the Pac-12 network. I don't get that. The one thing I will say is after today's podcast, they have a lot of college football games up on YouTube. There's this one YouTube channel where they condense all the three-hour games and they put them into 30-minute games. So you can watch tape in those games and catch up on everything you missed yesterday with your off day from work with no NFL on until next Sunday. So there's a lot of good things to um, say. But that's it for the QBs. Um, I was going to give you the rest of the show to talk about some of the NBA divisions. Um, I know the NFL is... Go ahead and break down the NBA division. All right. You broke down the Atlantic division yesterday. And let's break down the next division, the Central division. Um, We can start with the Chicago Bulls. Uh, Is this team going to be a borderline eight seed, or are they going to be picking in the lottery range again? I'm going to say lottery range. I say that just because Dwayne Wade's getting a little bit older, and then they lost um, some of their key players as well that decided to depart. They got rid of Jimmy Butler. I mean, really, there's really no upside or, hey, who's that guy that they really want to build around type of person. They got some really good players in the trade. They got um, some really good prospects from the NBA draft. In Providence point guard Chris Dunn, they got... um, they also got the marketing out of Arizona, but if those two guys don't step up, this is going to look very poorly on their end as far as trades and negotiations goes. You know, it sounds like based on the Chris Dunn and then uh, Lori getting picked like that, I feel like they're trying to build a good like foundation for a solid pick and roll team. But I think that they need to find a superstar point guard for that to work. They also got Zach Levine out of uh, Minnesota, who had won the uh, slam dunk contest early in his career. So they've got a few building blocks. They've got youth, and they've got building blocks. Now, this could either work. These guys could either come together and play well, and maybe they play well enough for Dwayne Wade to keep his job. But there's also the possibility that this could be a disaster, because Zach Levine's probably not going to play, even though he did well he's probably going to be a bench player to Dwayne Wade because Dwayne Wade's getting up there in age. And Levine's a guy who can average 10 points a game, but he's probably going to be used as a bench player to Dwayne Wade. I don't think Chicago's going to get the most out of um, Zach Levine unless they move uh, someone to the three. And that's the big issue because I know du- I, I, cause that's the issue. Jimmy Butler could play the two or the three. Chicago really doesn't have a guy who can play the three. They have uh, McDermott as their starting small forward. He's not that great. And they're basically going to have to, if they want to get the most out of their starters, they're going to have to put Levine at the two and Wade at the three. And Wade's not a natural three. So I feel like that's still an issue. Even though they do have some long-term pieces, they also lack a starting center. And Dwayne Wade's not happy, so that could hurt team chemistry. So... You're, you're, they're a team I'm on the fence about. You know, I agree. Um, they, they definitely could be a good reason to be on the fence. Um, I think they have good role players right now as far as the building blocks that you talked about. I think that this year in the draft, they really need to hit or they need to go out and make a splash in free agency. Yep. Next up, we have the Cleveland Cavaliers. And we talked about this team on Friday, Ryan. We said they're a divisional round team at best. Uh, they got Isaiah Thomas to replace Kyrie Irving. They still have Kevin Love. They have the ammunition to bring in someone else. And I love how everybody's saying, as long as LeBron's there, they're still the best team in the Eastern Conference. I don't know if that's the case. Yeah. And LeBron's probably going to leave after this season. Exactly. and that, I mean, they might be good for this season. They, they probably are a top three team in the East, but... As far as the future goes, it's looking pretty dim. 
I honestly could see them getting back to the playoffs even without LeBron if they keep everything they have and they get the number one pick and they use it on uh, one of the rookies and the rookie does well. That would be pretty hilarious, though, if that happened and the rookie got them to the NBA Finals and then it's the Cavs versus LeBron. That would be pretty hilarious. I don't think that will happen. That would be pretty funny. I don't think that will happen, but that would be pretty hilarious if it did. And then the rookie goes, oh, we're going to make LeBron pay for betraying Cleveland again. And then they put the crying Jordan meme on Dan Gilbert because he voted for Trump and talked smack about LeBron and talked about how uh, this team can win with or without LeBron. And I could just see them putting the meme on Dan Gilbert because LeBron's no longer a Cav and he loses the NBA Finals to LeBron, whatever team he signs with. That would just be funny. That would be classic. All right, the Pistons. I like the Pistons, but the problem is they don't have a good starting five because they traded Marcus Morris for... Avery Bradley on the Celtics, and they drafted Luke Kennard to top that off. So they did have an issue at shooting guard, and while they they did address it, I didn't like the po- shooting guard they drafted. They should have went with Donovan Mitchell. Instead, they went with Luke Kennard, and then they traded for Avery Bradley. So basically, Kennard's terrible on defense, and he's going to be an offensive player off the bench when Avery Bradley gets in foul trouble or whenever Avery Bradley gets injured. So the Pistons have an Achilles heel at power forward, and I'm not sure if Andre Drummond's too happy about that because Andre Drummond's going to need another player to compliment him on the perimeter. And even if the Pistons do make the playoffs, which I think they are capable of doing, they're still going to need somebody that can play the four. I mean, honestly, I feel like they took late. Who was it? Marcus Morris to the Celtics. Yeah, I mean, honestly, he was a big part of that tandem down low in the post game, so I'm going to say that they don't make it. I'm torn on them. I could see them getting in as a 5-8 through eight seed, but I'm really torn on them now. Because this, because I had them as like a 5 seed in the East before they, traded Bra- before they traded Morris to the Celtics for Bradley. Now I'm torn on them, so... That is definitely an interesting point. I guess I guess I, I'm more down the middle as far as I see them not making the playoffs because they got rid of the piece. I don't see any over talented superstars. I mean, DeAndre Jordan's great, but uh, or Andre Drummond, my bad. But honestly, I just don't see them making the playoffs just because they don't have any of the key superstar pieces that you would need to really excel in the season. Yeah, and the Indiana Pacers, they're next. They're, Paul George is gone after this year. I think they know that, but they don't want to trade him unless they get like something that's out of their reach. So I can see him just playing their year out. The Pacers have even changed their logo, so that's another issue. Um, so Yeah, as soon as they got rid of Paul George to the Thunder, that was pretty, that was a big hit. Yeah. All right, so I'm back now, but look, moving on to the Milwaukee Bucks. This team has Giannis Antetokounmpo. They have they got Jabari Parker. They do have some good building blocks. I just don't know if I can trust Jason Kidd and this team moving forward. They might get back into the playoffs, but I just feel like they're not ready to take that next step and get to the divisional round yet. They are still something they lack. I don't see them as a team with a complete starting five, so we'll see. I think they're talented enough to get back to the first round, but I just don't know if they are going to... I don't fear the deer, and I don't... I, I mean... <laughs> fear the deer, that's funny. That's their slogan when they unveiled the new logo, the new stadium. I just... I don't see it. It's like... Yeah... So that's interesting. Uh, the next, div- I think, with the Central Division, we see Cleveland as a playoff team. We could see one or two of these teams get in as a lower seed, five through eight. But I don't see any team in this uh, division outside of Cleveland that can make the second round of the Eastern Conference. Do you? 
You know, I, I, I can see Toronto, Cleveland, Boston. Those are pretty much the top three teams in the East. Um, yeah, I was talking Toronto about this. Kind of borderline. I was talking about the Atlantic Division with uh, Boston. I, I mean, we talked about the Atlantic Division on Friday with Boston and Toronto, how they're both going to make the second round of the playoffs. But with the Central Division, you've got the Bulls, the Pistons, the Pacers, the Bucks. I don't see any of those four teams making it to the second round outside of Cleveland. I don't think any of them would make it to the second round. That's what I meant to say. I mean... Yeah, but how many of those teams would honestly even make the playoffs at that point? Yeah, I mean, even... They're still Charlotte. There's still the other teams out in the East, too. So. Yeah, the Southeast Division, which we're going to get to next. Uh, the Atlanta Hawks, I'm selling them this year. They traded... They, they lost Millsap to Denver. They traded Dwight Howard to Charlotte, a rival... Um, I'm selling the Hawks. I think they're going to be in one of the teams that's actually in the running for a top five pick. That's my bold prediction: is that the Atlanta Hawks will be terrible this year. So, the Hornets, on the other hand, what tell well, tell me what you think about the Hawks while I pull up Charlotte's depth chart? Well, you know, I was actually going to say I agree. I mean, if you're the Hawks, how do you trade Dwight Howard? I mean, granted that he may not be as productive as he was when he was younger, but then. You still have some key building pieces. I mean, Shorter, to me, is probably one of the better point guards in the league. And to be able to not want to get Paul Millsap on contract and take care of him as well, I mean, between Dwight Howard, Millsap, and Shorter, they looked really good. They were a piece away from really making an impact in the playoffs. So i I, I got to say I agree. I don't think they'll be a top five pick, but I'll say top seven. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out who this M. Williams player is on the Charlotte uh, Hornets. Is it um, Marcus Williams, uh, M. Williams Hornets? Because he's a starting power forward, but I really like what Charlotte has, and I'll, I'll get to their lineup in a second. I can see this team... Um, yeah, it's Marvin Williams. I can see the Charlotte Hornets. I think the Charlotte Hornets will make it to the first round of the playoffs, and they will lose in seven games. I would love to see them make it to the second round, but I don't think they're there just yet, even though I love what they've done. They've got Kemba Walker. You've got Nicholas Batum and Jeremy Lamb as your number one and number two shooting guards, and they both averaged over 13 points a game last year. You've got you've got Michael Carter-Williams as a backup to Kemba Walker. You've got Michael Kidd Gilchrist. Even though he did terrible last year, he's still your starting small forward. You you also drafted Dwayne Bacon as a backup. Then you've got Marvin Williams as your starting power forward, along with Frank Kaminsky for depth. At center, you've got Dwight Howard at starting center, Cody Zeller for depth. I love I hated Kaminsky and Zeller in starting roles, but I absolutely love them in depth roles. And with th this front court is going to shut teams down. This front court is going to test people. And with their depth, with Zeller behind Dwight Howard, a proven veteran and superstar, he's going to get tougher and better. With Kaminsky behind Williams again, he's going to continue to play at a high level. So I think the Charlotte Hornets might have the deepest front court in the Eastern Conference with this depth. So, And they've got a proven superstar in Kemba Walker, too. So I see them making the first round and at least taking somebody to seven games. They might lose to a team like Washington or Toronto, but I see them taking a team like that to seven games and losing because I really like a lot of the components they have in place. You know, I think the key is going to be the bench and the depth because that's going to be what wins you those close basketball games, and I think that they drafted a really special player with Wayne Bacon. I mean, as you recall, he played really well throughout the summer league, and then, like you said, they added Dwight Howard. They, I mean, they finally got the big man that they needed at center to help relieve from that pressure. I think him and Kemba Walker get along great. You also mentioned uh, Nicholas Batum, probably one of the quietest good shooting guards in the league, if that makes sense. And they've got Malik Monk for depth. Like, Batum's their starter, Jeremy Lamb's their backup, but they drafted Malik Monk in the first round, too. So Malik Monk's like a third stringer right now, but he's good, so... Yeah. Exactly. I mean, honestly, this this Charlotte team is really looking great. 
I honestly can see them making the divisional round, Ryan. I know it sounds crazy, but with all the depth they have, with Kaminsky and Zeller in backup roles, with Malik Monk in a backup role, a walker, and with Jeremy Lamb, with Dwayne Bacon as a backup, they've got the starters and the depth to put together a team that could potentially win this division. If They're, they're the challenger to the Washington Wizards in this division. I think they're the clear challenger of the Washington Wizards. I don't know if they'll do enough to unseat them in that division, but I think they're the clear challenger to Washington this year. You know, i, I got to agree with you on that. I think they're going to challenge them. I actually think they might win just because they. I feel like they have better matchups as far as bench and then also at the center, point guard, and shooting guard position. I mean, if there's one team in this conference that I think... For, I think it's probably going to come down to Boston and Toronto or Boston and Cleveland, like you said. But if one team in the Southeast Division makes the conference finals, I think it's going to be Charlotte rather than Washington because Charlotte just seems like they have more depth. Washington seems like a team that would play well in the regular season, but Charlotte just seems like a team that's just well put together, has the starters and the depth to make a run, but it depends on who they get in the playoffs. But I think they're a playoff team. You know, I can agree with that for the most part. I won't disagree either. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing if they do make the playoffs. I mean, how far do they get? I mean, are they going to be one of those sleeper teams where everyone did enough work on the offseason that people overlook them? Or do they actually meet most people's expectations where it looks like they're great during the regular season and then postseason you kind of wonder what happened to that team? Yeah. Next up, the Miami Heat. They didn't draft a power forward. They they got a center in uh, Ben A. Boyo, but he's a backup, and they have Hassan Whiteside, so that pick puzzled me. Dre Gick is getting older. He's still effective, but he's getting up there, and I just don't know. This Miami Heat team has a lot of question marks. I think they'll do better than the Hawks, but I don't see them making the playoffs this year. Maybe that's where we disagree. I think that they don't do better than the Hawks. In fact, I think Miami Heat may be one of the worst teams in the league, and they're probably a top contender for getting that lottery pick. Um, why on earth you draft Bam unless you really plan on trading Whiteside? I mean, to me, that was one of the silliest picks on the draft. I think whoever's doing Miami Heat's general management for scouting and everything else really needs to evaluate why he made that pick and consider trading him off or getting or adding more players and pieces to the puzzle. Um, you know, their point guard, aging veteran, if I was them, I would go ahead and trade him to a team that has some younger players that need to be developed, and they just need a solid better point guard to help them maintain throughout the season or war into the postseason. So on the heat, I'm looking to make some trades and try and get as many picks as I can so I can start to rebuild. I don't know what their cash space is like. Go ahead and entice as many free agents as you can, and know that you're kind of starting to look at full crisis rebuilding mode of the post yeah, the Orlando Magic finally have a starting five for the first time since the 90s. Alfred Payton's their starting point guard, 13 points per game. Evan Fournier's their starting shooting guard, 17 points per game. They drafted Jonathan Isaac at six overall. He's going to start at the three. Aaron Gordon, power forward, he's going to play the four. And then you got Vucevic. So you finally have a starting five for the first time since... Um, they also have Terrence Ross, too, so we might see Ross begin the year as a starter, and then we might see uh, Isaac come in off the bench, because last year, everybody, they had Peyton Fournier, Ross, Gordon, and Vucevic in their starting five. All five players averaged over 10 points per game. The problem is they didn't have any depth, and they lost Jody Meeks, who averaged 10 points per game, was a good backup. They've got Mario Hezonia, and they've got Isaac for depth. They've got Bismack Biombo for depth, too, so they're going to be a really interesting team to watch because I think they're there offensively, but they're not there defensively, and that's the sad thing because Frank Vogel, the guy they hired, is supposed to be a defensive innovator, and we didn't see the Magic innovate defensively, even though their offense finally stepped up under Vogel, so... Vogel's a guy who I think's on the hot seat because he has an excellent starting lineup. They've even added more role players, and if he doesn't do something to improve the defense and the offense plays this well, he's out of a job. You know, I can agree with you on that. 
I mean, it sounds like the defense got developed, but or the offense got more developed, and now the defense is suspect in missing. Yep, and then finally, we have the Washington Wizards. Wall, Bradley Beal, Otto Porter, a lot of talent in the nation's capital, and this is a team that pushed the Boston Celtics to Game 7. You know, I agree. Um, I mean, you know, it's hard to say on who the best uh, point guard, shooting guard tandem is, like, as far as the East goes. Because I do like that whole Kemba Walker, Nicholas Batum, but then you have John Wall and Bradley Beal. And, I mean, Bradley Beal may not play as consistent as I would like him to, but, man, when he gets going, he gets going and looks like that premier shooting guard that you want in the NBA. Then John Wall, great passer, great handles, really good mid-range shot, in my opinion. I think that he has the potential to be able to lead the team. I just think that one of those two needs to step up in more of a leadership role to help carry the team as far as emotional um, stamina goes and not get gassed out towards the end of the season or frustrated. About yeah, that. and the, we'll look at the Wizards. John Wall, Bradley Beal, Otto Porter, Markeith Morris, Mart, Sin Gortat. Their starting five is excellent. The problem is they don't have depth. It's like if they stay healthy, they will win this division again. And they might even get to the divisional round again. However, they don't have depth. I think Charlotte is more likely to make a playoff run than Washington because they have depth. At the same time, I think Washington wins the Southeast Division. However, if Washington and Charlotte meet in the playoffs, I'm picking Charlotte because I think their depth would give them the advantage in a seven-game series over the Wizards. Now, if my memory serves correctly, uh, John Wall has been hurt a few times in the NBA so far in his career. Yep, John Wall's been hurt once or twice, and Bradley Beal has been hurt twice as well. And that's what's kept the Wizards from consistently making the playoffs. Yeah, and let's see, Chris, you, you said it right there, consistency. If both guys are getting hurt, I mean, it's so hard for me to sit there and, like, like I want to take Washington and say that the lead champs and beast because that's what they really are on paper. But like you said, they don't have the depth and then the health. It's hard for me to want to dedicate myself to picking them. I mean, on one end, we could see this team in the Eastern Conference Finals against Boston. However, if they play Boston again, I don't think it goes to seven games. I think Boston would probably beat them in five games this time around because the additions of Gordon Hayward and Kyrie Irving are something that Washington would have problems with. Oh, absolutely, and then, as, as we mentioned earlier, just the depth. I mean, look at Boston's bench compared to Washington's bench. They would get stomped. Exactly, so I think you're looking at a few teams. I think Bo I'm going to say we get Boston over Charlotte, just for the heck, just for the heck of it. I'm going to say the Eastern Conference Finals, we get the Boston Celtics over the Charlotte Hornets, just, just for the hell of it. I'm going to say we're going to have the Boston Celtics against the Toronto Raptors in the Eastern Conference Finals. I know. It's like we're giving LeBron the silent treatment. I know he hates that, but it's a contract year, and the only way I can see LeBron staying in Cleveland is if the NBA officials make sure to do everything in their power to hand the Cavs another championship. Because at that point, Cavs get the number one pick, LeBron wins the NBA Finals again, I think LeBron's convinced to stick around in Cleveland. But that has to happen. Yeah, you know, that's the thing, though, is I just, I just don't see it happening. I mean, look at Isaiah Thomas and his hip injury. I'm thinking that he may be on our last win, that we might see him get hurt. And I just see LeBron James blowing up in the locker room. And then LeBron James is stuck sitting there having to play the point guard position again as far as his dribbling This ball. team and reminds me of the team awesome. where he left Cleveland the first time and they had Shaq, an aging Shaq that was way past his prime at center, and then he was just so pissed against the Celtics that he left the team. That's what I see all over again. So I guess, Chris, my question then, and I think our listeners would want to know as well, more or less than 50% chance that LeBron James throws some kind of tantrum and frustration because of injuries teammates uh i'm gonna say more i'm gonna say we see lebron james leaving td garden i remember when lebron lost to the celtics in 2010 he basically just marched out of the building all angry and pissed we see that again 
I just want to see uh, the Denzel Washington with the Yankees hat where he's smiling like the meme where Denzel Washington, the Uncle Denzel meme. I want to see him smiling at LeBron as he leaves the building. I just, oh, yeah, that'd I just think that'd be, I think that'd be hilarious. And then we could get the crying Chris Cormier meme going again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so we both have Boston winning the Eastern Conference. I'm taking Charlotte as a sleeper. You're taking Toronto. That's cool. I like that we're debating over that, and we're giving the Cavs the silent treatment. Next up, we've got the Northwest Division, and this is a division that's really interesting. We'll start with your Denver Nuggets. All right, so to my knowledge, uh, we still have Daniel on the team. We still have Kenneth Murray. My best suggestion, trade them, get your value, get your picks. I'm not sold on either of those players. I think they're great role players. Are they going to be players that help the Nuggets get into the playoffs and do a deep run? Probably not. Are they going to contribute throughout the season? Absolutely. I think the Nuggets have a good chance to be able to win this division, but it's going to come down to Emmanuel Moutier and if his jump shot can be consistent. If he works on that jump shot and continues to make improvement, because I was a little bit wrong when I said that maybe he was a terrible player. I looked more at the stats, and I watched a little bit more game film. It seems like he's developing, so I'm willing to try and give him the next year to develop. I think right now, with the additions of Murray and the way he had played um, last year, I think that was a great start, and I think we're going to see a lot more of him. Absolutely. And next up, the team you love. It's a team that I think lacks depth if anybody gets injured, but it's a team you love, and it's the Minnesota Timberwolves, and their future is extremely bright. Even if they don't make the playoffs this year, next year they have two first-round picks, and one from Oklahoma City as well as one from them, and we'll see what happens. Um, Jeff Teague, Andrew Wiggins is moving. Andrew Wiggins and Jimmy Butler are interchangeable. Um, because both can play the three or the two. That's what makes them both great at what they do. So, And then you brought in Butler and Gort Goy Dieng at power forward only averaged nine points per game last year, but he averaged ten two years ago, and with the additions to Minnesota, they're projecting to average ten again. They've got Taj Gibson who for depth, so Dieng and Gibson... Minnesota's base, I thought power forward was a huge issue for Minnesota last year, but with Gorgao Diang and Taj Gibson for depth, they're projecting both players to have over 10 points per game, mainly due to the presence that Wiggins, Butler, and uh, Towns provides. They believe that those three players create enough synergy for those guys to get at least 10 points per game because people will focus on double-teaming Towns or double-teaming Butler or double-teaming Wiggins, and that'll open up things for the rest of this offense which is why their numbers are projected to go up. I still think power forward's the issue, but if Diang and Gibson both average over 10 points per game and T gets you 15 points per game, Tyus Jones shows he can be a solid sixth man, Jamal Crawford it steps up in a depth role. If all of those things happen, Minnesota can make a run. But if the power forward play has trouble, then this team's going to be in trouble. As long as Teague, Butler, or Carl Towns does not get injured, I would say there's at least a 50% chance they make the playoffs. Yeah, I, I, I feel like it's going to be a stronger chance. I mean, I'm pretty sold on Jimmy Butler being a superstar. And now that he has, in my opinion, he has more talent around him now. He has Carl Anthony Towns. He has Andrew Wiggins. I mean, really, it's getting set up for him to be able to succeed. I think that they might actually end up winning the division that my dear, sweet Denver Nuggets are in. I think that is a possibility. Minnesota is definitely a team where they could either, they're going to do better than they did last year. They could, they picked seventh in the draft last year. They could either pick anywhere between 10 and 14, or they can make the playoffs. And it's a we'll see, you can do type of thing. But I don't think they will make the NBA Finals this year, but they get two first-round picks next year, and if they hit on both of those and they keep this core together, this team will have the pieces to upset a team like Golden State in a year from now if they keep everything together and potentially even put themselves as the team to beat 
in a year from now. Most of the pieces are there, so, though. I, so I have a question then. Same thing that I kind of asked earlier a little bit, but I'm going to raise the number percentage. More or less than 80% chance that the Minnesota Timberwolves are able to actually win a championship in three years. I'm going to say less. I'll say 70 or 60%. Is Golden State still in this division? I know Curry's going to turn 30 soon, and their window of opportunity is closing, but I still think for the next two years, Golden State's going to be the team to beat in this uh, conference. All right, all right. I am actually going to disagree with you, and I will say that right on the mark at 80% that the Minnesota the Wolves can win a championship in three years. I would love to see a Celtics versus Timberwolves NBA Finals because then Kevin Garnett would be there as a fan. He wouldn't know who to root for. He'd be in the crowd, but he wouldn't yeah. know who to root for. You know, he might get creative and wear one of those jerseys where it's half and half with his name on it. Yeah, he might. I mean, you never know. He might just wear a Celtics shirt and a Timberwolves hat, or he might wear a Celtics hat at a Timberwolves jersey, and he'll get he'll get like the cane that the Celtics mascot has. Oh, That's man. what he should do. He should get the cane that the Celtics mascot has, but at the same time, he should he should wear the Celtic hat and wear a Minnesota jersey, and it'll be like he's oh, taunting the Celtics. Great. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, he's pointing the basketball up in the air like a member of the Harlem Globetrotters, and he's got the cane, the Celtics cane, and he's just standing there like a casual fan. Because I feel like ESPN or ABC, if we got a Timberwolves-Celtics NBA Finals, ESPN or ABC would focus more on Kevin Garnett than the actual game. Yeah, that's true. That's very true, too. But you also have to remember, though, Minnesota is definitely the market, so it might not be as bad as we think. Yeah. Next up, the Oklahoma City Thunder. And this team, they brought in Russell. They've got Russell Westbrook. Didn't they bring in someone to compliment him this offseason? Who was it? I thought they brought in someone. Maybe they didn't. I keep thinking they oh, yeah, did. They brought in uh, Paul George. Wait, I thought Paul George is still in the Pacers. That trade got vetoed. Oh, it got vetoed. Yeah, because the Lakers were I mean, trying to get Paul did. George. I don't know if they were. Oh, uh, okay, he yeah, but he, 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 uh, Paul George is on the Thunder. I thought he was still on the Pacers, but he's on the Thunder, and the Lakers basically got busted for tampering. They did. So, yeah, the Thunder are probably still a playoff team now. I don't know if they'll recreate yeah, the... Yeah, playing for the Thunder. They got to the second round last year, even without Durant. Can they get to the Western Conference Finals? Probably not. Can they get back to the divisional round? Absolutely. Um, just, just a side note, because we had kind of just talked about Paul George. It sounds like the Lakers have gotten fined about, like, Yep, and we'll get to that in a bit. Once we, uh, the next two teams in the Northwest Division are the Blazers and the Jazz. I could see both of these teams making the playoffs, but I don't think I could see either one getting past the first round. And Gordon Hayward was the the main guy in Utah, so I doubt they would make the playoffs. I think they're probably the worst team in this division now without him. I agree. Um, I was really high on Utah. I thought they were, they were going to be the team to be here in the next couple of years. But, you know, honestly, it's kind of been the same pattern I've seen with them as a team for the past decade. Is They have a really good team on paper. They play great throughout the regular season. They play and beat some really good teams. But then for whatever reason, it seems like they just lose the gas on the pedal or whatever the case is. And then all of a sudden, you just kind of see them sink a little bit. Yeah, and next up, the defending NBA champions, the Golden State Warriors. They are they are building a dynasty in the NBA right now. Two NBA Finals in three years. They were one win away from three-peating 
but they blew a 3-1 lead in 2016, and they have so much talent back. They've established continuity. They're the team to beat, though, in the league, so... We're still going to talk about the other teams, but how many other teams in this division can make a run? Because I feel like the Kings aren't there yet, even though they did get a, have a really good draft and really good free agency. The Suns, they lost Brandon Knight, their backup point guard for the season. They still have some holes offensively before they can contend. The Lakers, I feel like the Lakers are probably the closest thing that Warriors have to a challenger this year. The reason I say that is because the Clippers lost Chris Paul to the Houston Rockets. So I feel like if there's a team, Golden State's going to run away with this division again. They might be the only team in this division that makes the playoffs. At the same time, I feel like if a second team in this division is going to challenge them, it's going to be the Lakers because they, they brought in Brooke Lopez. They brought in Lonzo Ball to replace Russell. They've made a plethora of good moves. They got Josh Hart for depth. So I love what they've done this offseason, and I think with what they have in place, they're probably the one team in this division that has a chance to challenge for a playoff spot. Because I think this is Golden State's division for the most part, but if there's one team in this division that can make the playoffs, I would say it's the Lakers. You know, I agree with you. Um, I think the Lakers are actually going to probably... I, I'm, I'm going to say it's going to come down between like the Lakers, the Nuggets, and then maybe the Blazers as well be able to really uh, get that wild card spot in the Western Conference. Yeah, and af after teams. we do the Southwest Division, by breaking that down, we can try to project one through eight in the West because I don't think there are eight elite teams in the Western Conference. I think there's Golden State, there's Houston, and... There's San Antonio, and there's maybe Minnesota if they put everything together and stay healthy. Those are the top four I'm looking at. See, and that's the thing, is we just committed sports blasphemy. We keep forgetting about the San Antonio Spurs because they're so quietly good. I mean, talk about all the teams. Year after year, though, I'll tell you what, I still think that they're going to be the team that dethroned the Warriors this year just because I think Leonard's another year experienced, and then Aldridge and... Uh, Spurs seem to have gotten their problems fixed. I haven't heard as much about the bickering uh, last year. There was a lot of trade rumors floating around, too. So, Yeah, so we'll see what happens. The Mavericks, they still have Dirk Nowitzki. They got Dennis Smith Jr. in the draft, which was an awesome selection. I feel like they still need another center before they complete their starting five, but most of the pieces are in place. They do have Harrison Barnes at small forward. They've got Wesley Chandler at shooting guard. This is a pretty complete team for the most part. If they can get good center play next to Dirk Nowitzki, I think the components are there for them to get back to the playoffs. You know, I I can agree, but I don't think they'll make the playoffs. I don't think I they think will either. Start focusing. I think they'll I think end up. Focus on developing Dennis Smith. Yeah, I think they're going to end up in the ten through fourteen range of the draft and barely miss the playoffs, but. I do think they're going to be one of the com more competitive teams. Like you're looking at the team that's going to be three, one to three games out of the final playoff spot, but but they're going to miss the playoffs. But they'll be extremely competitive. Uh, yeah, you know I agree. That definitely makes sense. I, like I the, see uh, anywhere like between contest. thirty-eight and forty-four wins, but the ninth best <laughs> record in the Western Conference. Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll agree. Next, we got the Rockets, and I feel like what would happen is if we got Golden State, San Antonio in the Western Conference semifinals, and then Houston, Minnesota in the other game, that would be cool because we get to see a new team in the conference finals. But at the same time, it would be pretty obvious that the Golden State, San Antonio winner would probably uh, would probably win the conference in that situation. So. But Golds, Houston, Minnesota would be fun because if those teams met in a Western Conference semifinals, you'd get an underdog team, you'd get a team that people would want to root for and rally around, but they might not be ready to take that next step. And it would be cool to see one of those teams in the finals, though. But Houston, 
I'm going to pick Houston to win this division, but I think the Spurs would probably get further in the playoffs than Houston. I, I could easily see Houston losing to a seven seed if they draw a team like the Lakers or the Timberwolves or even the Thunder again, I could see them losing to that team, even with Chris Paul, even with the additions they made. There's just something in my gut that tells me the Houston Rockets will beat the Spurs in the regular season and win the division, but they'll lose to a seven seed in the playoffs. Whether it's a team like the Nuggets or the Lakers, if they end up getting the two seed and they face a team like the Nuggets or the Lakers, or the Timberwolves even, my gut tells me the Rockets will lose that series. I don't know why, that's just what my gut is telling me. You know, I, you know, for some reason I feel like Houston's finally going to get past like the second round. I think we're actually going to see a Game 7 in the Western Conference Finals between the Golden State Warriors and the Houston Rockets. I think it's possible. It's possible. It. it I think there's a few teams in this conference. Memphis, they got rid of Zach Randolph. I feel like they're on the brink of entering a rebuild, even though they still have Gasol and Conley. They could push for a playoff seed. We'll see. And then you've got the Pelicans with DeMarcus Cousins, Anthony Davis. They have some pieces in place. If they could stay healthy, they could be a dark horse in this conference. But it comes down to how healthy they are. There's been uh, rumors going around now that the Pelicans are trying to shop off DeMarcus Cousins. So, Pelicans might be back in rebuilding mode. <laughs> yeah, the Pelicans are the dark horse. They could either be a borderline playoff team or they're back in rebuilding mode. They're the dark horse. I, I gotta ask this as a basketball fan, and I'm sure our viewers are curious because, you know, you definitely have some good knowledge on the game. Why didn't that combination of Anthony Davis and DeMarcus Cousins work as well as a lot of people, including myself, thought it would? I, I think it works. I just don't think they have the role players to complement them yet. So you think it'll come down to I, trying to get the solid true point card? I'm, I'm always been a card. firm believer in you need a starting five to win a championship. Golden State had that last year. Cleveland had that the year before. Golden State had that the year before. So I don't think New Orleans has a starting five. I think they have a very good front court, but they don't have the starting five to complement him. They don't have the point guard play. They don't have the forward play. They need to be more consistent in that area. And if they are, they could be a playoff team. And if they're not, this team is going to eventually blow up. They're going to trade Cousins for a draft pick, and they're going to go back to rebuilding. That's what it comes down to. I agree. I agree. All right, so I'm just looking at the Western Conference, and based on the starting lineups I'm seeing, I'm seeing Golden State, I'm seeing San Antonio, I'm seeing Houston, and I'm seeing Minnesota as the teams that can contend for making it to the, being the contenders in the Western Conference. I like the Lakers. I think the Lakers have the talent to get to the playoffs. Are they ready to take that next step and win a series? Of course not, but... I think they are talented enough to get back to the playoffs. So, it, you know, I am going to make a bold prediction and say that if the Lakers can make the playoffs as something that is a seven seed or higher, because I don't think that they would be Golden State. But if they do make it as a seven seed or higher, I will make a bold prediction and say that the Lakers can get into the second round because I do have that much faith in the additions. Yeah, and that's why I said earlier that if Houston ended up playing a team like the Lakers, but the Spurs got the four seed, that I could see the Lakers winning that series. Oh, okay, that's what you're kind of referring to. Exactly, So, because if Houston got the second best record in the conference and the seventh seed they drew was a team like the Denver Nuggets or the Lakers or the Timberwolves, I think they would lose that series. Now, as a Nuggets fan, Chris, and we definitely do have a growing fan base, I'm curious, more or less than 60% of the Nuggets can actually make the playoffs and get into the second round. I think you can make the playoffs. I don't think you'll get past the opening round, though. Disappointed, Chris. I think I gotta go. My mom's calling me. (laughs) You're joking, but like... I, I mean, if Denver wins the division, it's possible because I think this division, you're looking at Oklahoma City and Minnesota as the two main teams, but I think Denver's that surprising dark horse. 
and we're disrespecting Portland by giving them the silent treatment because they do have Damian Lillard. They do have a good core of guys coming back, but they barely got in as the eighth seed last year, and they got swept by Golden State. So, you know, and I think that the only issue that the Blazers have is outside Damian Lillard and CJ, they don't have someone that's going to be able to really boost them with a lot of points. I know that they had traded for Nurkic, but, I mean, he's either consistent or inconsistent. I think he's going to be the X factor in Portland's success. Yeah, and they did move into the top ten for Zach Collins out of Gonzaga as well. So he can play power forward or center. So we'll see what happens with Portland, but... That's our NBA preview, and I think we're both coming to the same conclusion that Golden State will beat Boston in the finals. Yeah, I would say it's probably going to be Golden State and Boston. Um, my next, I would say my next uh, prediction would probably maybe be San Antonio, Boston as well. Yeah, there's a lot of different things that could happen in the NBA. We talked about college football. We talked about some of the games that happened yesterday. Um, I was going to quickly mention some of the things I saw in Major League Soccer before I wrapped up the podcast. Not Major League Soccer, but college soccer, because I saw Gordon Wild on tape. He actually played a lot better in the second half. He made a penalty kick. That ignited the team. He had an assist in overtime. So it was a 3-2 overtime game, but there was no scoring in the first half, and the first half was just unwatchable. But the second half was just spectacular. It made up for everything that the first half lacked. And then the Stanford Cardinal have gotten their fifth shutout in a row in college soccer. Two of the games were exhibition games, but they have not surrendered a goal in five games. And Tomas Hilliard Ars out of Stanford, he's led them to -to back-to-back championships. He's starting to look like the number one pick in the Super Draft with his defensive play. It's too early to say. I'm really hoping Albert Ruiz returns from an injury soon. He's missed the first three games. But we'll see what happens with um, college soccer this year. It's too early to speculate on whether or not Stanford's going to three-peat, but they look like such a complete team that I could see them three-peating. Do you think Stanford three-peats, or do you think three-peating in college sports is extremely difficult to do and that somehow they will fall fail to three peat. Just curious before we wrap up the show unless you got any additional topics you want to get make any points about. You know, I got a good feeling about them. I'm going to go ahead and I'll say three peat or mm-hmm. repeat I should say. Three peat cuz they won the college cup in men's soccer each of the last 2 years in a row and this would be the third year in a row. So, I'm going to say no, three peat as well. Because they haven't allowed a goal in you know, five games. I think that this team, this uh, the Stanford team that you're talking about, is very special. I think they're actually going to end up put, helping put soccer more on the map in America, and I think we might actually see it become a little bit more popular here in the next few years as well. Yeah, because Tomas Hilliard Ars had a top five left back next to him and Brandon Vincent after his first or second year on Stanford, and Brandon Vincent. Gone? No problem. He wins another title as a junior after winning one as a sophomore with Vincent, and now it looks like he might win another one as a senior. So when you have that kind of leadership, yeah, L.A. is probably going to take that guy number one because Magic Johnson wants to win, and Magic Johnson's one of the partners involved with LAFC. So he go. it's a local kid. He's won in college. He's won in college consistently. That's sort of what I see Magic Johnson doing with the number one pick. And I still think Gordon Wilde and Albert Ruiz go top five, even though they haven't gotten on to, off to hot starts like we would have liked them to. I still think they're too talented to fall out of the top five, but at the same time, I think Hilliard Arce is probably the front runner to go number one overall now. Yeah. I'll, I'll agree with that. Because he's team captain. He got voted team captain this year, and his leadership is speaking for itself. Five shutouts in a row in, as team captain, that's impressive. That, you know, that is pretty impressive. Like, how many team, sports teams can say they shut out their opponent five games in a row? I don't care any, what sport um, it is. That's pretty I'm impressive. Say not very many. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. And they shut out number 23-ranked Creighton. So Creighton's been terrible this year. They got shut out by Virginia Tech, too. But 
Stanford, they're making a case. So we'll see what happens if Stanford three-peats. It's going to be interesting. Um, you want to talk about the Brock Osweiler coming back to Denver or anything else before we wrap up this call? It's a little hard to talk about. In fact, I'm still trying to get over the fact that we were foolish enough to sign Brock Osweiler. I mean, I would rather put up with a Kaepernick media circus but I never see that guy in a Broncos uniform again. And I mean, for the record, it's not necessarily that I'm like, oh, you know, he left Denver, he didn't accept the deal. It's what I saw that season before, which is where it was, you know, you throw five picks in a game, and then you're going to have to make up injured Peyton Manning, who we didn't start that game because he was hurt, have to come in and play to save our chance at a playoff berth. And then on top of that, Mr. Big Shot over there thinking he's worth all that money goes down to Houston, does absolutely nothing except for steal their money and eat some cheeseburgers. And then on top of that, he gets traded to Cleveland, who you think would, you know, probably have a better shot because, let's face it, most of the time in years during Cleveland over the past couple, it's basically been a disaster and a complete wreck at the quarterback position. So you probably have a good chance to start. And you still couldn't even beat out a rookie. Like, come on, man. You're not that great. And in fact, that's why I'm thrilled that it sounds like he actually got the deal for less than a million dollars. So at least now it's kind of like a, you're getting paid what you're worth, which is peanuts and Italy squat. Yep. I think Chad Kelly is making more money than, uh, I'm, I want to, I, that's, I, I'm, I was going to end the show, but I want to compare his salary to Chad Kelly's salary. Cause Chad Kelly was Mr. Irrelevant. And I think that would be pretty cool to do. All right, let's do that. Just because I just think that would be pretty cool to compare them before. Um, cause Chad Kelly's Mr. Irrelevant. Chad Kelly is making $348,000 this year, so even though Brock Osweiler got less than a million dollars, he's still t technically making uh, more, double what, because uh, Brock Osweiler's getting 725000 for one year, Chad Kelly gets three hundred forty-eight thousand this year, and three forty-eight times two is six ninety-six, I believe. So, he's, Brock Osweiler is still getting twice the amount of money Chad Kelly is receiving. That's kind of sad. <laughs> I mean, just because he just because he's not that good, and despite what Tracy had said about him throwing pitch to what was it, fifteen touchdowns, which is yeah. impressive. If you didn't have sixteen interceptions to go with it, yeah. And then, isn't it true that if you're throwing the ball less than a sixty percent completion rate in the NFL, you're probably not that good? Yeah. I feel like they're just using yeah. Osweiler as a scapegoat so they can let Chad Kelly develop this year because they don't want to cut him or send him down to the practice squad. But at the same time, they want to have that stuck yeah. fill in gap because. Actually, I like Slaughter better. The but... time Brock Osweiler was because Paxton Lynch had injured his shoulder. So we didn't, hey, I used to check that guy in the death gym. All right, sorry about that. I saw somebody from my old job. Um, yeah, no, I mean, honestly, though, I mean, I just, I, the only reason we brought him in was just because Paxton got hurt. A lot of people, like the local kid, I forget his name. He was at CSU. I think it was like Slaughter or something like that, Slaughter. There was a guy and from Northern yeah, Colorado like, named Kyle Slaughter. Mark Zuba told me he was the best quarterback in last year's draft because he hated the quarterbacks in last year's draft. And Slaughter impressed, so. He, he really was. Uh, I mean, to be completely honest, Chris, I watched uh, the preseason and the game that he had played in. You talk about a guy that has a nice spot, crisp spiral where that thing doesn't flop all over the place. And then on top of that, he makes good reads. He has a good pocket presence as well, good mechanics. I was actually really impressed with him. I hope we keep him on the practice squad and try and bring him in next year. Yeah, I mean, we got a lot of football coming up this week. Tonight we get two games, West Virginia, Virginia Tech. They're both ranked. That's on ABC at 7.30. Then 7.30 on Fox you get Texas A&M and UCLA. Thursday night it's back to the NFL, Patriots, Chiefs. And then on Saturday we get... Um, USC hosts Stanford on Fox. Oklahoma travels to Ohio State. And Clemson plays Auburn. I think both of those teams are unbeaten. And that's going to be a big game, too. So there's going to be a lot of football games with high-stakes implications on this upcoming weekend. So 
I'm really curious to see how it plays out, Ryan. It's going to be a fun week coming up this week, and the best part is you get to relax all day, and any games you miss due to work, they're up on YouTube, and you don't have to watch the entire game. You just get the 30-minute condensed game, the fast version. If there's any games you want, whether it's Florida State, Alabama, Michigan, Florida, they're up on YouTube. I can send you that on tape. I'm just glad I made it through this show without sneezing because I've had a really stuffed nose, really bad cold, and I'm just glad I made it throughout, made it w without like um, sneezing on the air. So I'm pro yeah, I should probably yeah, get I'm some usually, rest. I usually you hear me sniffing a lot, and that's because my allergies are bad. But I was actually able to buy some allergy pills, and it feels good to breathe again. And my eyes aren't as blurry as what they were because of the uh, congestion. So. Definitely a good day. Yeah, it definitely is. So thank you, everybody, so much from the Utopia of Sports for tuning in. We'll see you guys in a week from now, episode 337, the week before the NFL season. We'll be up on Talk Shoe in a little bit. It'll also be up on YouTube. Um, not sure what we'll title the episode on YouTube, but we'll talk about that off the air. Enjoy your weekends. Um, so long from the Utopia of Sports. We'll be back next week when the NFL starts. So long. Have a good Sunday, fun day. Oh, talk shoe did this to me again. And Kerm left uh, early. Well, on that note, I'd like to say that I'm seeing a bunch of uh, joggers running around the park. I think they're doing some kind of Broncos marathon, actually. A lot of people wear Broncos gear, so... Huge shout out to all of the great runners that are down in the Denver area right now contributing to that event. Um, you know, definitely a lot of athletes looking looking good out here running around. I don't see a lot of people showing any signs of getting tired, so definitely a good day to get that jog in. Uh, going to show you once again that the city of Denver is always staying active and staying busy. Yep, and the upcoming episodes for Draft Utopia on September 10th, 3.38, NFL Week 1 preview show, which is next Sunday. And two weeks from now, we have NFL Week 2 Electric Boogaloo. I just thought that was a funny title. Joey hated it for some oh, reason. Though. Is this like the Jungle Book? Every remember uh, like remember in uh, Sunny in Philadelphia, they have that one episode titled Charty McDennis 2 Electric Boogaloo? Yeah, what the hell? <laughs> I just thought Week 2 Electric Boogaloo had a nice ring to it, so I just went with that as the episode title for two weeks from now. Are, are you sure you're not uh, one of the writers on It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia? <laughs> I, I just thought that was a great title for a future episode, and Joey thought I was drunk when I came up with the title, so it all works out. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I suppose it does. Yeah, uh, the episode notes, Chris Ransom, Joseph Potter, Ryan Romero, Andrew Kermish recap Houston-Cincinnati. We also look at one game between 0-1 teams in depth and one game between 1-0 teams in depth before going over SWAT reports for the running backs in the NFL draft. I think we were going to do the running backs. Uh, yeah, we were going to talk about the quarterbacks uh yeah, I need to update the episode Simnosis because I have the quarterbacks for next week's show on the 10th. And then um, I forgot to mention the because, yeah, I need to put the running backs for next week and the wide receivers for two weeks from now because the wide receivers are going to be fun. That's something that all the receivers impressed this week. So that's actually going to be a, a fun show. We can mention the receivers in the Electric Boogaloo show, too. Because it is sort of like a boogaloo to determine who's the top receiver with all the competition. So, sort of like a decathlon. So, maybe we'll mention them in the electric boogaloo episode. We'll see. So, Chris Ransom, Ryan, and Romero, again, we're signing off from the Utopia of Sports. We'll be back in a few weeks. So long, and enjoy your Sunday. Call recording oh. has been completed. And we're off the air of... Uh, we're off the air on um, YouTube as well. This video is going to be going up directly to YouTube. And if you can't see me straight, it's because of the nose, because of the allergies. I, I don't know if I'm having allergies or what it is, but something like that is really making it harder for me to breathe.